Mr. Tink says to him, the shadow was in the big box. She meant the chest of drawers, and Peter jumped at the drawers, scattering their contents to the floor with both hands, as King's Tossa happens to the, sh uh, to the crowd. In a moment, he had recovered his shadow, and in his delight, he forgot that he had shut Tinkerbell up in the drawer. You get to the right page, because I'm not going to bore you with all of this. Page 34. Now, Wendy comes out and sees him, and then sews the shadow onto his feet, so he now has his shadow again. And we get to the place where she says, for when people in our set are introduced, it is customary for them to ask each other's age. And so Wendy, who always liked to do the correct thing, asked Peter, Peter, how old, how old are you? It was not really a happy question to ask him, it was like an examination paper that asks grammar. I don't know, he replied <coughs> uneasily, but I'm quite young. I am. Uh, he really knew. He stopped and thought for a minute and said, Okay, Wendy, I ran away the day I was born. Well, Wendy was quite surprised, but interested, and she indicated in her charming drawing room manner with the touch of her nightgown that he could sit next to her. That's because I heard father and mother talking about what I was to be when I became a man, and I don't ever want to become a man. I always want to be a little boy and to have fun. So I ran away to Kensington Gardens and lived a long time among the fairies. She gave him a look of the most intense admiration, and he thought it was because he'd run away, but it was really because he knew the fairies. Now, when they had lived such a home life, that to know fairies struck her as quite delightful. She poured out questions about them to his surprise, for they were rather a nuisance to him getting in his way and so on. Still, he liked them on the whole and told her about the beginning of fairies. You see, Wendy, when the first baby laughed for the first time, its laugh broke into a thousand pieces and they all went skipping about, and that was the beginning of fairies. How tedious talk this, he said, but we must stay at home. Then he liked it. And so uh, there ought to be one fairy for every boy and girl. Ought to be, Peter? Isn't there? No. You, you see, children know such a lot now. They don't believe in fairies. And every time a child says, I don't believe in fairies, there's a fairy somewhere that falls dead. Oh. Really, he thought he talked about enough about fairies, and it struck him that Tinkerbell was keeping very quiet. Yes. I can't think where she's gone to, he said, rising, and he called, Tink! Tinkerbell! Tink! Wendy's heart went flutter with a sudden thrill. Peter! You don't mean to tell me there is a fairy in this room? Well, she was here just now. You don't hear her, do you? Mm -hmm. Well, the only sound that I hear, said Wendy, is like well, that's Tink. That's fairy language. I think I hear her, too. The sound came from the chest of drawers, and Peter made a merry face. Wendy, I believe I shut her up in the drawer. <laughs> <laughs> he let poor Tink out of the drawer, and she flew about the nursery, screaming with fury. Ah, oh, come on, Tink, you shouldn't say such things. Of course I'm very sorry, but... How could I know that you were in the drawer? Wendy was not listening to him. Oh, Peter, if she could only stand still and let me just see her. Oh, wow, they'd hardly ever stand still, he said. But for one moment, Wendy saw the romantic figure come to rest on the cuckoo, cuckoo clock. Oh, oh, the lovely, she cried, though Tink's face was still distorted with passion. Tink? This lady says she wishes you were her fairy. What does she say, Peter? He had to translate. Well, she's not a very polite fairy. She says you're a great ugly girl and that she's my fairy. Now, Tink, you know you can't be my fairy because I'm a gentleman and you're a lady. To this, Tink replied in these words, Oh, you silly ass! <laughs> and disappeared in the bathroom. She's quite a common fairy, Peter explained apologetically, and she's called Tinkerbell because she mends the pots and the kettles. They were together in the armchair by this time, and Wendy plied him with more questions. If 
But don't live in Kensington Gardens now. Sometimes I do still. But where do you live mostly? Oh, with the, the Lost Boys. Who are they? Oh, well, they're the children who fell out of their perambulators when the nurse wasn't looking the other way. And if they're not claimed in seven days, they are sent far away to Neverland to defray the expenses. <laughs> I'm the captain. We are rather lonely, though. We have uh, mm -mm, uh, no female companions. None of the others are girls? Oh, no. Girls, you know, are much too clever to fall out of prams. <laughs> this flattered Wendy immensely. <laughs> I think it is perfectly lovely the way you talk about girls. John over there, he despises us. For reply, Peter rose and kicked John out of the bed, <clears throat> blankets and all. Just one kick. This seemed to Wendy rather forward for a first meeting, and she told him with spirit that he was not captain in her house. However, John continued to sleep placidly on the floor, and she allowed him to remain there. Oh, Peter, I know you meant to be kind, so you may give me a kiss. For the moment, she had forgotten his ignorances about kisses. Oh, I've got your wand back, he said bitterly, and offered to return her thimble. Oh, dear, no. <laughs> Shall I give you a thimble? Yes, if you wish to. Peter thimbled her, <laughs> and almost immediately she screeched, Ah! Well, what is it, Wendy? Well, it was exactly the sound of pulling my hair. <laughs> <laughs> that must have been Tink. I never knew her so naughty before, and indeed, Tink was darting about again using offensive language. She says she'll do that to you, Wendy, every time I give you a thimble. so that she doesn't have to fly anymore. And Wendy is given the hat to carry. We know that, um, and, and they had just been shot at with the long John gun, so everybody is scattered all over the sky. Now we know that no one had been hit. Peter, however, had been carried by wind of the shot far out to sea when Wendy was thrown upwards with no companion but Tinkerbell. It would have been well for Wendy if at that moment that hat. Now, I don't know whether the idea came suddenly to Tink or whether she had planned it on the way, but she at once popped out of the hat and began to <coughs> to her destruction. Now, Tink was not all bad, or rather she was all bad just now, but on the other hand, sometimes she was all good. You see, fairies have to be one thing or the other because they are so small. They unfortunately have room for only one feeling at a time. <laughs> they are, however, allowed to change. Only it must be a complete change. At present, she was full of jealousy for Wendy. There is a story back here that I will finish up with. Peter has stayed behind him. He's been asleep. The book has come down and put poison in Peter's medicine, or as Wendy says, medicine. And she makes him take his medicine. She has a mother who's supposed to do that to Tink. And Tinkerbell comes back. He, Peter hears a knock knock on the door. He says, Sir, who is that? For a long time there was no answer, and then again, knock knock. Who are you? Loved being thrilled. In two strides he reached the door. I won't open until you speak, Peter cried. Then at last the visitor spoke in a long, bell like voice. Let me in, Peter. It was Tink, and quickly he unbarred to her. She flew in a 
excitedly, her face flushed and her dress stained with mud. What is it? Oh, you never guess, she cried, offering him three guesses. Out with it, he shouted. And in one ungrammatical sentence, as long as the ribbon conjurers pulled from their mouths, she told of the capture of Wendy and the boys. <gasps> Peter's heart bobbed up and down as he listened. Wendy bound on a pirate ship. She, oh, I'll rescue her, he cried, leaping at his weapons. And as he left, he thought of something he might be the things at. He would take his medicine. No, she shrieked Tinkerbell, who had heard Hook muttering about the poison that he had put in Peter's medicine. Why not, Tink? It's poison. <coughs> poison? Who could have poisoned it? Captain Hook. Don't be silly. How could Hook have gotten in here? And he raised the cup. And in no time for words, time for deeds. And with one of her lightning movements, Tink got between his lips and the draught and drained it of its drops. Why, Tink, how dare you drink my medicine? She did not answer. Already she was reeling on the air. What's the matter with you, cried Peter, suddenly afraid. It was poison, Peter, she told him softly. And now I'm going to be dead. Oh, Tink, did you drink it to save me? Yes. But why, Tink? Her wings would scarcely carry her now, but in reply, she alighted on his shoulder and gave his nose a loving bite. Mm -hmm. She whispered in his ear, silly ass, and then tottered to a chamber and lay down on the bed. His head almost filled the full hole that he drew as he knelt near her in distress. Every moment her life was growing thin, and he knew that if it went out, she would be alone. She liked his tears so much that she put out her beautiful finger and let them run over him. Her voice was so low that at first he could not make out what she said, and then saying, oh, Peter, I think, I think if children really believed in fairies, I would get well. Peter flung out his arms. There were no children there, and it was night time, and he addressed all who might be dreaming of the Neverland, and who were therefore nearer to him than he think, boys and girls in their nighties, and naked papooses in their baskets hung from trees. Do you believe, he cried. Tink sat up in the bed, almost briskly, to listen to her fate. She fancied she heard answers in the affirmation, and then again she wasn't sure. What do you think, Peter? If you believe, he shouted to them, clap your hands, don't let Tink die. If you believe, clap your hands and don't let Tink die.